Hi, everyone. If uh, you're just joining us, as you are, we'll just wait for the uh, room to fill up and then we'll get started. Good morning, everybody. We'll just wait for another 30 or 40 seconds and then we'll get started. All right, I think uh, it's 10.01, so uh, let's get started. And good morning, everyone, wherever you are tuning in from. Uh, my name is uh, Chris Kilford, and I'm the president of the Canadian International Council uh, branch here in Victoria. And I'd like to welcome our uh, CIC Victoria members, other uh, CIC members from branches across the country, uh, our guests, and of course, our guest speaker and moderator, uh, also. And we're really glad that you have uh, taken the time to join us uh, here uh, this morning. Before we get underway officially, I'd like to uh, recognize that uh, CIC Victoria members, uh, we live, work, and learn on unceded Coast, uh, Coast Salish territory. And we give thanks to the Lekwingen people, uh, now known as the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations, for allowing us to meet on their uh, lands today. Now for this morning, our moderator is Marilyn Denton, and uh, Marilyn retired in Victoria after 27 years working for the federal government, and she is a member of our uh, CIC Victoria Executive Committee as well. Her final assignment was Trade Commissioner for uh, Vancouver Island and, and head of the Victoria Office of Global Affairs Canada, and most of her career was spent in Ottawa. However, she's also lived in Pakistan and Jamaica and traveled extensively in the Asia Pacific region for, uh, for work. She was also one of the two founding staff for the Foundation for Educational Exchange between Canada and the United States of America, which is known as the Fulbright Scholarship Program. And as I mentioned, uh, Marilyn has been a member of the executive committee for uh, several years now and uh, really uh, uh, plays a big role and, and often moderates. And Marilyn, I'm going to hand the floor over to you for our event today. Thank you, Chris. For those not familiar with the Canadian International Council, we are an independent, nonpartisan, membership driven think tank with the express mandate to engage Canadians on international affairs. What makes us different from many think tanks is that we have branches in 18 Canadian cities with some 1,400 members who are deeply involved with and interested in Canada's role in the world. You can find out more about us by Googling the Canadian International Council or visiting our CIC Victoria Facebook page. And if you're not a member of the Canadian International Council and would like to join our great group here on the island, uh, and I should add that we have almost 430 members, including just over 100 students here in Victoria. Please get in touch with us and Chris will put out a contact, a contact email address in the chat area. So if you check the chat area and you're interested, you'll find an email address there. For today, and after introducing our guest speaker, Brenda Shoup, Brenda will speak for about 20 to 25 minutes, followed by an audience question and answer portion. And for this portion, please use the Q&A function, and we will do our best to get to all of the questions. We are also recording this event. Brenda, as many in the audience will know, is a member of CIC Victoria, and she brings a global perspective on food system leadership. 
and she has visited a wide variety of farms and food processing floors around the world. In her decades of independent farming, Brenda also developed a regenerative practices and served in leadership roles provincially, nationally, and internationally in agriculture and agri-food, finance, policy, research, and animal health. Her book, Three Times a Day, Leadership to Feed Our World, will be published in 2021. Brenda was also recently appointed to the Canadian Food Policy Advisory Council, which is tasked with co-creating the nation's first food policy. Brenda, welcome, and over to you. Well, thank you very much, and hello, everyone that's joining us from around Canada and also our international special guests. I'd like to start our conversation this morning with this statement. We have more than enough food. What we don't have is a modernized global economy. What we don't have is a functioning infrastructure to deliver on the promise of access to food for all. And what we don't have is a state recognition of food as a universal human right. Most certainly farmers have done their part between uh, 1960 and now they've more than doubled their production on the same unit of land. And between 2000 and 2018, farmers were able to double meat production, double cereal grain production, and increase value added foods for people around the world at the rate of 67%. All of this while losing 80 million hectares of arable land to urban development. In that same period of time as well, we saw the big stall. The economy stalled in 2014 and it was our first taste of shifting from a globalized agenda to a nationalized agenda. And some of the consequences were a little devastating. And by 2018, nearly one fifth of investment in food systems in developing countries was withdrawn. And that gave us uh, a lot of malnutrition and hunger. So one in 10 persons in the world is food insecure right now. And we're now looking at levels of hunger that we haven't seen since 2010. There's no normalcy in hunger. If somebody's hungry, it is because the food system and or the political system has failed them. And these examples show us that the production of food is not tied to the availability of it. We have more than enough. So the question is, where is the food? And I guess we can start that conversation with food waste. Right now in the world, we waste between 40 and 50% of our fruits and vegetables, 35% of our fish, 30% of our cereal, cereal grains, <clears throat> pardon me, and 20% of our meat, dairy, and oils. In Canada, food waste equates to 35 and a half million metric tons a year for the cost to the economy of $49 billion. And it occurs almost entirely at the plate. And where you stand in the world really depends where the slippage is in uh, food waste. In parts of global south and specifically in parts of Africa, 70% of food is wasted right post harvest. A lack of infrastructure, a lack of transportation, a lack of markets, a lack of refrigeration, and of course, a lack of storage. And there's a lot of studies that are done worldwide that indicate that the prosperity of a nation is directly tied to its ability to store agricultural goods. And in that regard, Canada rates number seven. If we take a look at 
the infra the universal challenges to infrastructure or to food systems, which which, which is what I was talk asked to talk about. We'll start, of course, with land. Less than 7% of the world's land is arable, and we're losing about 2.8% of that a year, particularly to urban development. And under the land profile, there's a few things happening that really are disruptive to a food system. The first one is that a lot of the land is leased. So church and state are still major owners of land worldwide and some large individual landowners as well. And even in Canada, 43% of, of the farmland is leased. And a short-term lease does a couple of things. It's highly disruptive to the food supply chain and it can change or modify behavior. In other words, if a farmer is feeling really pressured because their lease is just for a short period of time, they may push that land a little hard and push the ecological limits on it. Culture also plays a big role as well. In parts of the world, a family can be farming, they're feeding themselves and feeding other people and say the husband should pass away. In that case, um, in parts of the world, the land then goes to his next of kin, not to his spouse. And I saw this firsthand um, visiting with women in a slum in a, just outside of New Delhi. And in that 800 person community, 67% of the ladies were displaced because their husband had died and they no longer had access to their home or their land to farm. And so this had a huge impact on, on um, gender's capability to continue to farm around the world. And then of particular interest to CIC members is the area of conflict. I, I think of the beautiful lands in Syria, the billions of dollars in lost production and many more to recover it as an example. Unfortunately, when land has been in conflict and if it's been contaminated, in areas of conflict, we lose up to 50% of productive land that would normally grow food. So it makes it very difficult for these countries to reestablish. We've often heard that you can't have peace without food, but you can't have food without peace either. We've done a lot of things on the technical front to grow food. We can grow food without sunlight. We can grow food without soil, but we've yet to grow food without food itself as a base and without water. I was very fortunate in my recent graduate studies to work with global leaders in food. And the conversation always came back to an overarching concern, whether that be in the production of food, the processing of food, the transportation of food, the byproducts of crops such as fabric, and that was water. We see areas of the world where water is handled well, such as New Zealand with their rainwater capture systems, something that we should seriously consider here on Vancouver Island where the water is measured in meters and also ancient systems. So for example, when I was uh, in Arequipa and on the steeps of the Andy's there with the terrace farmers, and, and I wanted to talk to the farmers about, or I was talking to the farmers about their, their farm. And right away, the first thing the farmer did is he pulled out his genetics magazine because they were running all Canadian genetics, and Canada has a stellar reputation worldwide on the genetic front. I was asking about his agronomic practices, you know, about his crops, the lucerne that he was growing there and also about water. And he pointed up to the hill and he said, the water's been coming out of that mountain for the last thousand years and it hasn't slowed down a bit. And there was a very important lesson in that. If that, if that mountainside on the other side of it is disrupted through mining or any other activity, it actually affects the flow of water all the way down. 
And we most so certainly have seen when man interferes with natural waterways, what happens? Uh, the Fertile Crescent is the prime example. Fertile Crescent, 12,000 years of tremendous agricultural production. The cradle of agriculture was where the wheel was invented and all of these things. And once the marshes were drained for a couple of reasons, uh, flushing out of troops and also for irrigation, that area dried up. And so if the, there are processes in place by nature, we need to understand that. This conversation becomes more important when we talk about Canada later. And of course it takes people to produce food. And in 2008, we saw a major shift in the world for the first time in history, those people in the city outnumbered those in the country. So right now, globally, one in six persons lives in a city uh, near a shore, usually near a port. And if you look on your world map, that's exactly what you'll see. And in Canada, that's one in eight persons. Women play a very huge role in the production and the processing of food. They are nearly 50% of the world's farmers. It's been said that one in three women on the globe is directly employed with agriculture. And on the food processing floors that I've been on all around the world of every description, I can honestly say that with the exception of red meats and pork, that the majority, I would, I would say from my experience over 90% of the of those floors are staffed by women. In Canada, one in eight persons is employed by agriculture. And if you add food manufacturing, that's one in four. We have uh, a tremendous employer of agriculture within the nation, uh, more so than auto and aerospace combined on the manufacturing end. Pre-pandemic, we were already 126,000 workers short in Canada. And that most certainly hasn't changed. And around the globe, the issue of getting labor after this huge attrition from the countryside is, is at a desperate stage. Uh, the UK, 86,000 people short, Germany, 300,000. Gives you an idea of how many agriculture workers are needed to put the food on the table. And in all of this, we can't forget about money. Um, it's been very difficult in the past for farmers to get money. When I was um, farming with our family, we had done a huge agricultural expansion in the 1980s. It was all at between 18 and 21% interest. And at that time, even in Canada, you could not get a fixed loan if you were a farmer. Uh, globally, the interest rates for farming is very high, it's 11.8% on the average, with the highest being at 55%. And talking to different, especially women around the world that are financing uh, food products and agricultural products, there's often a requirement of 100% collateral. So finance is very important. And the Global Food Index really tackled this when they said the single most thing that influences food security in a nation is a farmer's ability to access finance. And you'd think that with all this finance and uh, all the amazing technical advances in the world, that everything would be digitized. There's 10 companies that fund trade, four of them are digitized. And if you take a look at global trade, only 25% of global trade is digitized. So. If you've got a ship and it's sailing across the ocean and eight containers fall off, who's going to know? It's somewhere in that 136 paper copies. And so we have a strong desire worldwide as leaders to step up to the plate and digitize the entire system. It's all part of infrastructure. Infrastructure uh, requirements, especially in electricity, roads, and telecommunications is very, very high yet. Uh, Oxford came out with their estimate and it was a shocker 
because it was double of what was published in 2014, but it looks like a 94 trillion US, $94 trillion bill to get the infrastructure going by 2040 so that we have a functioning system. And I just would like to use a little story to maybe bring that to light for you. I was at a dairy just outside of Bangalore, owned and operated by a woman, which was unique in itself for that area. And she was just simply doing everything right. She had um, beautiful fields, her agronomic practices were stellar to second to none. Her cattle were in terrific shape. She was chopping the feed. Ruminants have four stomachs, so they like their feed chopped up. The cattle were covered. She had three different breeds there that she was milking. She had a crossbreed or what we call a dual purpose that would live a little longer. She had a Holstein, which would give a lot of milk. And she had a water buffalo for their fantastic butterfat uh, content. The milk had a, has a fantastic butterfat content. She was managing the waste and by her own admittance was one of the top producers in the area. But at the end of the day, her milk light went in cans without refrigeration. It then went and sat at the edge of the road, waiting for someone to pick it up. And when it was picked up, it was mixed with other milk. And I don't see any difference between her situation and a woman on the side of the road with her vegetables waiting for a collectivo to take her into town to sell them, or a Western Canadian grain farmer waiting for a rail car and hoping that they can get their product to port. The infrastructure has weak links in different places. And I always say that investment is futile unless there is enabling policy to support it. And next to water, when we have discussions or I have discussions with world leaders in food, it's this enabling policy that allows us to move forward. And, allow, and like the woman in, in India, the idea of product identification so that she can, as a high-end producer, get paid for her product separately. So let's talk about Canada. Well, Canada too has less than 7% of its land is arable. We too, as I mentioned, are often farming on a short-term lease. We have our labor problems and we're desperate for product identification, uh, some sort of system where we can product, identify product of higher quality without it being mixed prior to port. The estimation on our infrastructure bill is 60 billion. It is primary in roads. Canada still, to the astonishment of our international neighbors, still has one road that's narrow in places. And of course we have ice roads, fly-in areas as well. And many of our islands are supported by barge and float. And we do have the longest coastline in the world. So there's a lot of remote communities to feed. The area that is next is electricity. Believe it or not, there's still communities in Canada without constant electricity, even though we're an exporter of hydro and telecommunications, which the federal government has taken an interest in. We are, however, the fifth largest producer of agricultural commodities in the world, primarily in wheat, canola, soya, beef, pulses, and cereals. And we have a fantastic food and beverage industry that in 2019 was worth $117 billion. Over 6,000 food processors in the nation and agriculture and agri-food knock it out of the park, contributing 7.4% to GDP. Food manufacturing alone is 17% of all manufacturing in this nation. So I want to be clear, there's no other economic driver as strong as agri-food in the Canadian economy. We also have a distinct advantage of holding within our borders 20% of the world's 
fresh water supplies. This is something we cannot mess up. We have to preserve that water supply for food production. If Canada is to position itself correctly, it needs to manage that water for food production. We have already a stellar reputation when it comes to food safety and food product. Uh, one of our roadblocks, I guess, is that we just don't know it. And that's why this conversation is so important, so that we recognize as Canadians that we are a food economy, that we will continue to be a food economy, and that we have to be strong in our positioning as such. Our crippling factor is provincial jurisdictions and interprovincial barriers. It has been extraordinarily difficult on the Canada brand, and it's been extraordinarily hard on food insecurity. Food insecurity in Canada is one in seven persons. So the idea that food can't move from one provincial jurisdiction to another is really rather outdated. And as leaders, we are struggling and have been for many decades on how to enhance that and how to approach the provincial jurisdiction issue. There's so much diversity in this country. In the island that I live on alone, there's over 100 fruits from the sea, over 200 crops, and over 100 different time, types of berries and nuts and indigenous foods. So capturing that diversity is going to be critically important as we move forward. Largely, one of our areas of growth is going to be in ingredients. Canada is seen as a preferred ingredient provider around the world and in value adding to foods. And that's highly nutritious foods that have a long shelf life. Uh, I think if we look into the future with a lens, this is one of the areas that we do have to focus on. It's important because I'm thinking of the time I was in a cake factory. So I'm in a Canadian cake factory and this is, I would say, 18 years ago. I'm in this cake factory and the ingredients for each batch of cakes came on a big pallet, so a four by four, meter by meter, or so large block of ingredients. The mixing bowls were kind of the size of my living room. And I was so curious as to where all these ingredients came from. And so I asked for them to unload the pallet so I could see where the, what the ingredient list was. Excuse me. And at that point in time, uh, not one of those ingredients was from Canada. And there was provincial jurisdictions. There was a little bit of a supply managed issue. There was all kinds of excuses. But we're pretty much out of excuses now. We're the fifth largest exporter of commodity those commodities could be value added at home. We have the potential to double our growth here. We need leadership in that area. And that means regional and rural development. The idea is to keep the food chain short. So processors want to be close to the supply and have the infrastructure that, to get it to market as well. We uh, have still have, despite the fact that one in eight Canadians live in the city, we've got a strong trusting consumer for our food. And that's something we really have to honor and work with. 98% of our farms are still family farms and over your 70 or over 80% actually of our food process, processors are SMEs that are family owned. So we have the ability to fully enhance the rural profile as well. And a lot of that is going to be our responsibility as leaders to ensure that municipalities have the information, that they understand conversations like we're having today, that the money stops at food and that they have infrastructure support and so on. We're a highly technical country, four out of the Top 10 tech cities in North America are located in Canada. We're known for our technology. Let's attack that, that trade file. Let's, let's digitize things here. Let's get our telecommunications up and going and, and get things done. 
the traceability file alone, the global traceability file alone, meaning that file, that way of tracing food all the way to the end user is worth $24 trillion. It's massive. And so um, Canada is well positioned on the technical file. And of course we have trade agreements. We need a little more power, our own power in our trade agreements to ensure our partners are adhering to their, their side as well. And also to under, going back to that understanding ourselves and what we have, people are asking for green and clean, we can deliver on this and to take a stronger stance and also to explore additional trade agreements, particularly bilateral ones with our targeted um, consuming public. We've got some cool things going on. Uh, just on that light, we've got a cross sector, cross ministry, um, so all kinds of interest in the development of the National Agri-Food Sustainability Index, be one of the only ones in the world as well, where, uh, and I've heard in our discussions at CIC and other places, many ambassadors talk about the need to import green and clean food. We can not only do that, but have an index to prove it as well. And we've got the development of the food policy, the national food policy. Again, Canada leading the way uh, in the development of the food policy, which covers all the things that I talked about today and many more, goes much deeper than that. It's across ministry and, and it goes right from um, tackling our food insecurity right through the enhancement of our trade profile. And I know today I've talked a little bit about weak links, but I have to say we don't have weak leaders. I've been very fortunate and honored to work with leaders in food and food systems around the world. And they are a deeply caring bunch. They understand this is food and this is water. And they're very concerned that they haven't been able to deliver on food as a universal right. They, they take that in as their responsibility. So, they really care. They understand that food systems are about the people within it. And we're seeing a shift, even though we are truthfully seeing a shift to a nationalized agenda over a globalized one. I think that's a natural progression to step back and reevaluate and regenerate. A lot of the efforts are becoming a lot more collaborative worldwide rather than so independent. And so that collaborative spirit is advancing Canadian company, companies in a terrific way. It's all about building resilient communities. And um, every food system, if you think about it, starts at the community. And our future starts at the farm. So with that, I'd like to thank you for joining us. And if you're Canadian, I hope you have a better appreciation of the food system within Canada, of our opportunities and our challenges, and that you're very proud of the food that we grow here. And if you're joining us from outside of Canada, well, welcome to our table. And we hope you've enjoyed the conversation and will join us again. And with that, Chris and Marilyn, I'll go back to you for questions. Thank you very much, Brenda. That's uh, most interesting. And I look forward to your book coming out. Um, I do encourage people to use the Q&A function to send in some questions. And I have one to start with. Um, Brenda, if you were to write an op-ed piece for the Times columnist, what would you advise individuals to do to make a difference to food security? Wow, that's a really great question. You know, there's a lot of food security initiatives that have happened in the Victoria area. Uh, uh, the recovery of foods from grocery stores and that sort of thing. So there's always a little bit ongoing but if I was to think about our own food security, I think I'd start perhaps with a little bit of 
um, an evaluation of what we consume and start with the food waste, start there and start to be conscious of, of what's going on. And then a stronger focus on not so much social programs, but affordability. A lot of food is not available to persons in community because it's not affordable. And of course, we're seeing massive food inflation right now uh, post during the pandemic and it'll, it'll stay for a while. And um, I have to be honest here. We feed people not with food, we feed them with money. So until we have, uh, if my op-ed was to do anything, it would talk about wage parity. There is no leg legal, ethical, logical, or historical reason why we can't have wage parity here and around the world. And if we want families to access food and to increase food security, we start with wage parity. Okay, um, again, I do welcome people to send in their questions. I, I have a second one. Um, what are your views on the priorities of the Canadian government? And if, say, you were in a position to set those priorities, what, how would you organize them? Or what would you say are the top three? <laughs> Huge question. Uh, thank you for that question. Right now in agriculture and agri-food, we have tremendous leadership with Minister Bibo, who's very receptive. So one of the things when I talk about enabling policy, one of the things that we do have in Canada is ministerial access. We're always invited to the table. There's lots of discussions, there's round tables, there's many different ways to, to get involved. The last budget was very friendly to agriculture, uh, specifically on the sustainability and the technology side. I think that we need to uh, have a refocus on one, a social const construct on the labor issue. We need to revisit that. So how is it that we can bring in families as an example so that we have consistency in the production of food to feed into that food chain. Thus, giving some comfort to both farmers and food processors within the nation to, um, to go ahead and expand. That's one thing. I'd focus on a, a complete social construct there. And also I would get back to rural development to the empowerment of municipalities. Yeah. I think that we've, we've had such um, a glare in our eyes as we look at the world because we understand our potential, but we have to remember that if we don't have that strong rural fabric and those resilient communities, we don't have the, the core product that it takes to position ourselves accordingly. Thank you very much. Um, Chris, I understand you have a question. Yeah, thank you, uh, uh, Marilyn, and thank you, Brenda, for raising so many um, important issues. We've been focused at CIC on foreign policy by Canadians, looking at the country, looking at um, the world and how we see Canada in the future. And you you reminded us of some of our strengths. You know, uh, I heard you say we are the fifth largest producer of uh, things such as wheat and canola and pulses, that we have 20% of the world's uh, fresh water supply. And uh, we do that with just 7% of our land being, being arable. And I don't think food comes into the equation very often when we think about um, foreign policy, but, but it is a part of that. So I wanted to, just, first of all, thank you for raising those, those issues. But I do have a particular question. You, um, you mentioned about um, the food waste that goes on in Canada, uh, fruit, meat, milk, uh, large percentages and, and big money, but you said at the plate. And I, I wanted to ask you, what did you mean by at the plate? Is this wastage after it comes into the homes of Canadians? Yes, thank you for asking for that clarification. Yes, it's all at the consumer level, almost all at the consumer level. So we have very little wastage at the farm because we have, we're, we're, we're highly 
leveraged with storage. We're, we're good on storage. Uh, food processing has done a stellar job in the reduction of waste. And they've had to do that partly because of the labor component as well. Everything's intersects, right? Uh, but where we see the issue is at the consumer level. And you can go into any grocery store in Victoria at closing time and uh, there they're throwing out all the baking of the day because it does it isn't carried over. I've got, you know, I've talked to people, I've photographed this, uh, or most have that type of thing because there is, you know, such strict food safety policies in place. And that has a lot to do with it. We um, have only the food bank to feed the poor in this nation, which is a rather interesting thing for a developed nation. And I'll just tell a story here. You might find it interesting. Dad always went to the food bank to pick up the food that people didn't want. And so we would come home with a whole truckload of food uh, particularly baked goods and ruminants can eat baked goods. Cattle can eat uh, baked goods and onions and all French fries, everything. They've got four stomachs. They can do just about anything. And we'd always laugh that if the cows ever got out, all we'd have to do is rattle a bag of bread and they'd come running home. But there's at every level, we have so much abundance and our global production is so high it's just not getting to the people because of the infrastructure or they can't afford it when it gets there. But Canada's at the plate, um, um, which means from the consumer level on, we're throwing it away after dinner, we're throwing it away because we bought too much. We're throwing it away because we decide we don't like the taste. That's what we're doing in Canada. Thank you. Um, I have a question from Eugene. Will the current emphasis on agroecology change the amount of food we produce? Oh, well, thank you, Eugene, joining us from Alberta. Um, will it change the amount of food that we produce? I think that we're going to start to see a bit of a stall. And most certainly, like if you take land like India that produced for 9,000 years and then started to see a reduction in production in the last 150 because the land we burned it out you know our our pesticide use as an example globally is very low like china's 13 and a half kilograms per uh hectare and we're 2.7 or something like that that sort of thing so we're not to that that point yet but i think if we do the equal agroecology right we'll actually enhance the production of food but there will be a period of time in there, a transitional period of time in there, where, we're, where we are relearning our practices on how to do things regeneratively and in collaboration with other things. So a perfect example, um, Eugene, is the winery that I was in in Australia, where half the winery was left conventional, you know, everything sprayed out underneath the and in very, very industrial way of doing things. And the other half, they allowed to go back into its natural ecology, only biological control, weeds everywhere, that sort of thing. The production on the biological half, the winery doubled and the grape was sweeter at making a higher uh, level or higher quality wine. So that really shocked the owners and they had 4,000 acres that they were doing this with. So it was a big thing. So there, all things are possible, um, but there will be a transitional period. Thank you. Um, I have a question from Tom Ball. You talk about free trade agreements across the globe. Do you think a free trade agreement between provinces is necessary and if so, achievable? That is a great comment and actually something that I didn't think about, but that's Tom, that's exactly what we, we need so that we can start moving goods across, across the nation. I have to wait for my son to send me that dandelion gin from Montreal. And I you know, but seriously, it's, it's, 
a great idea. And um, maybe that's an avenue that we could could use a formal platform, a formal platform that allows uh, the players to come to the table. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Chris, you had another question. I do. Um, so Brenda, I know that you are quite involved with, with farmers, speaking to farmers, writing about various issues. And um, when we think about global, global warming, we, we think about rising water levels and, and farming and agriculture. And I, I wonder what's the, what is the, what are the main concerns that Canadian farmers have with, with global warming? How do they see that, you know, impacting on them negatively and perhaps some areas uh, potentially positively? Right, well, on the positive side, of course, we're seeing a lot of action in the Northern parts of the provinces and the Yukon and so on. Um, we're, we are seeing ag move. We're also seeing the crops change considerably. The areas uh, that were once all wheat are now corn because corn A has been bred for a shorter season and, and now the heat units are there. Things are, are definitely hotter, that's for sure. What we really lack, and this goes back to maybe the Times call on this question too, is the data like a lot of, we're, we're short on hardcore data and especially weather data, like it's only maybe a couple hundred years worth that we have. And that's not enough to draw anything, any conclusion on really truly. So we need to look at data um, in, in a new light and gather as much as we can. Most farms and most sectors have taken up initiatives on their own. So carbon sequestration is a primary uh, example where they're leaving cover crops in or they're planting extra trees or they're measuring it more importantly. They're, they're going out and measuring it to, to ensure that they are actually contributing to the solution. And people like Microsoft and uh, Amazon and all kinds of uh, folks are interested in buying those credits uh, because they need to offset themselves. So it's actually could become another revenue stream. So it's driving good practices. The revenue stream, the potential revenue stream then also could drive good practice for those that maybe don't appreciate it to the level that is required at this time in history. And I use that carefully, time in history. Thank you, Brenda. I'd love to sit down and learn more about your life and, <laughs> and, and more about uh, food security, but I think I'll pass the uh, reins over to Chris because we have no more questions. Uh, but I do, actually. Oh. I do have another one, and I know we're uh, fast coming up to the end of our, our hour, um, but Brenda, you haven't had a chance to talk about your recent appointment to the Canadian Food Policy Advisory Council. So I, I wanted to know, um, how did you get on that council? How were you chosen? How did you come to someone's attention to be, to be um, asked to be on that council? So that's, that's number one. And the council has been tasked with co-creating the nation's food uh, first food policy. Well, you know, for someone that's not involved in the agricultural world, I'm not quite sure what that means. So could you, could you talk about those two issues for us? Right. So a food policy ensures that we have nutritious, affordable, culturally appropriate food for all. So that's, you know, the overarching goal. And within that, the minister has set out, you know, six different pillars that we want to ensure, and of course, and part of that is, is the building of communities and uh, making sure there's resiliency and many other things. The beautiful part about the development of a food policy is it is, uh, doesn't include necessarily those from agriculture. There's maybe four of us on the entire advisory board with an agricultural background. So you have every level of society contributing and that's the beauty of an advisory council. You have every level of society contributing um, and every level of food production contributing and you have a, a strong showing by First Nations and 
remote communities and all of these things that we need to consider. So uh, the, the food policy takes all of the things that I talked about and many, many more because I didn't get into the social aspects at all of food. And it, it, it gives us this huge task, uh, six year volunteer task <laughs> to get together and to one by one uh, bring forward suggestions to the federal government on how to implement the food policy. So people are, are appointed from every walk of life uh, based on their background and their credentials. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, perfect. Thank you. Marilyn, uh, shall I, um, I see we're, we're coming up to the end of the time. So shall I carry on? Yes. Okay, I will. You wrap up. Thanks. Um, Thank you for that. And and uh, f first of all, to the audience and, and to, to Brenda in particular, you know, one of the things I found about CIC Victoria is our, our, our strength is in our membership and not just the numbers, but in the people that we have in our organization that have such unique backgrounds. I didn't really ever think that when I was uh, here that I'd be talking about food policy, but but uh, I was watching what Brenda was writing for various uh, publications and, and the international implications of food security. And we did have a discussion prior to this event. And I think it's an, really, I think it's an incredibly important um, discussion. And before I sort of wrap up with just some quick notes about our upcoming events, Brenda, I wanted just to turn the floor back to you if you have any, any final comments for our audience today. Well, I was, I was really appreciative of the opportunity, Chris, because I think as Canadians, we maybe don't realize uh, how strong our, our food position is in the world and, and how we play a major role, uh, not only in peace, but also in feeding the world and feeding ourselves moving forward if we handle ourselves correctly and uh, put on our big girl and big boy pants and be very strong when it comes to to trade agreements and and that sort of thing i'd invite you all to contact me through linkedin or my website brendashep.com if you have any further questions it was a lot of information this morning but i i did want to just lay it out there as to where we were at in the world and how we play and um I hope that you got excited uh, when you thought about all the potentials within our nation. So thank you so much to CIC for this wonderful opportunity. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Brenda, um, for uh, exposing some of this world to us. I'm sure many of us <laughs> do know a little bit about this, um, but but it is a new area for us to talk about at CIC Victoria, and it does play into so many of the other issues we talk about when we look at uh, the developing world and the struggles that many countries have, uh, especially surrounding food security. So you've brought much of this to light, you know, and we are recording this event for the folks that weren't able to be here this morning, and so we will get that link around to them as well. So on behalf of all of us, uh, at CIC Victoria and, and on, on all the audience. Uh, we really appreciate you spending the time with us today. And Marilyn, thank you so much also for being a part of this and, and moderating. Um, and uh, we, will, uh, we will be back with new events. And I just wanna talk about some of those very, very briefly. Um, you all know that I love Turkish history. So you have me to blame for this one. But on the 12th of May, we have author Jeremy Seal speaking about his new book, uh, Coup in Turkey, A Tale of Democracy, Despotism and Vengeance in a Divided Land. And he's actually talking about the 1960 coup in Turkey that led to the execution of the prime minister at the time. And he will also be then uh, relating much of what he will he will say to the current situation that we find in, in Turkey uh, politically. And uh, for those of you that are Turkey watchers, you'll know that there was an attempted coup in Turkey in 2016. We're then gonna move on on the 25th of May to have uh, Dr. David Carment and a, and a team uh, talking about their new book called Canada Among Nations, Political Turmoil in a Tumultuous World. And I'm uh, 
some of the authors we have will be focusing on art, the Arctic and some of the other issues that Canada faces. And then um, an event that I've uh, spoken about briefly before, but one that I'm really excited about on the 8th of June, uh, we will have Ambassador Jennifer May with us. Now, uh, Jennifer is our ambassador in Brazil. And we met with her team yesterday to talk about the event and what we would touch on. And uh, we'll be out with more information on, on that uh, in, in the near future. So uh, if you're a guest out there today, um, please uh, look us up on the web, CIC, the Canadian International Council. Uh, we are always on the lookout for new members to be a part of the team and to support the work that we, uh, we do as an organization. So that's enough from me. And in closing, thank you again, uh, Brenda. We'll see you at some point and Marilyn as well. And we'll be out of this virtual world and back to normalcy and to the politics and the pubs and other th such things. Okay, all right. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you for participating.